Thank you. Good afternoon. I think the first uh, takeaway I would have is that in real life, don't add governance to your board meeting agenda right after lunch. Right? So that's the first uh, practical tip. But uh, with that, uh, let's get straight into it. I know we're running short of time. We're already missing one panelist who had to catch a flight back. Maybe that's another good reason to invest in the earlier pitch, the e-plane pitch, because then she could have taken a e-plane taxi to the airport and still been here on the panel. But uh, with those two quick anecdotes, I'm going to sort of reverse the order and maybe just take two quick inputs from the audience on what you would like to get out of the panel, because I think asking the question at the end is something we can anyway come to, but what would you like to hear from the panelists? So very quickly, any sort of two quick observations? Yeah, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. How do you context switch between so many different industries uh, as governance, which is such a serious um, thing to be taken care of? How do you contextualize between different industries and governance? Is that your question? Yeah, the different regulations for each okay. different industry. Got it. And anything else that the audience would like to raise as something that we should cover? Great. So anyway, you can keep thinking about it and, uh, you know, we'll come to questions at the end. So maybe I'll just get started uh, straight away. I think it's important maybe for us as panelists to first define what we mean by governance because it's such a sort of overloaded and overused word. Maybe if you just go one by one starting with you, Neha, in terms of what do you think is the meaning of governance? Uh, no, that's a that's a good question. Typically, when you know you discuss about governance, it's about you know getting your audit in in uh, in process, having no qualifications, the basic hygiene. But uh, you know, governance is just is much more than just that, and uh, uh, you know it involves a lot of other things. So uh, just to give a parallel from the public markets, you know, public markets obviously have a lot of plus point for companies with high governance. Uh, versus, uh, you know, uh, the, the private man. And uh, it means a lot of things, right? It, it, it not just means that, you know, your basic hygiene, uh, your numbers are correct, your financials are getting uh, filed on time, the, all the other reportings are, you know, on, uh, on time, uh, stat dues, et cetera, you know, which is basic. But I think it, it means more than that, right? To just highlight a couple of things. One is, uh, uh, you know, as a business, uh, I, you know, also the little bit on the business side, you know, it means consistency. What, what consistency means is that, you know, what you're reporting. Uh, to give you an example, sometimes you're reporting user growth, sometimes you're reporting, uh, you know, ASP growth, sometimes you're reporting some of the matrices growth in a particular region. Uh, so it's not like selectively cherry picking what you want to report. So, you know, one basic thing is, for instance, you know, consistency in what you're reporting, right? So uh, to the investors, to the key stakeholders, when I, when I mean. Uh, another thing uh, which is also there is just predictability, right? Like if there is, uh, if, if something is not correct, then at least your key stakeholders are, you know, uh, you know aware of that happens and nothing comes as a surprise. Uh, you know, that's another example of sort of a good governance. Um, a third, another example of governance can be just having, you know, good processes internally. Uh, like, you know, th there was uh, some companies were in, you know, some data is there, but some data went uh, missing, uh, you know, and the cr critical data went missing, not the other thing, there are a lot of other data, but like financial data, for instance, right? So just small things like having this, those basic systems in place. So, you know, these are just, you know, three examples of things apart from what we usually talk about governance, but I think governance is a lot more to do with, you know, how you're running, how you, you know, it, it involves a lot more functions than just the basic financials, I would say. Oh, thanks, Neha. Vivek, uh, do you want to go next, please? Yeah, thanks. Um, the way I understand it is uh, governance is, I believe, the, the process in which decisions are made. And uh, in an organization, in, in a startup for sure, I mean, your high impact decisions are uh, your choice of people and the organization, uh, financing, of course, which includes then the investors and other stakeholders. Uh, strategy, which is product and brand, and then operations. So there are different, you know, internal and external stakeholders, and involving them in the right way, uh, in a way that ensures and fosters an environment of trust, to me is basically uh, good governance. So building on what Neha was saying, uh, it's definitely more than clean financial reporting and conduct with the board, but like across all these dimensions that I mentioned. Thanks, Vivek. Kanika? Yeah, I think just one level above that, right? Just 
uh, the flow, I, th I think a lot of it comes down to good faith intent and that broadly defines governance. Um, if you're trying to do whatever it is that you're doing in good faith, you will broadly fall on the right side of governance um, and that should be your guiding light, um, especially early stage when you don't have as many processes in place. No, very helpful. I think just a quick addition from my side, you know, I think people often confuse compliance and governance and I know Neha you touched on that. I think governance in my opinion is everything other than what is already rule based. So where there are rules, where there are regulations, complying with that is de minimis, that is basic hygiene. It's sort of as they say what you do when no one is watching, that's really what uh, governance uh, should be. Just uh, staying with that uh, Vivek, if I can come back to you, you know there's often this debate on balancing innovation and control slash governance and I think this becomes more contextual in startups where everyone wants to be running really fast and creating new products, services, uh, you know, being nimble. Do you think there's really a sort of contradiction here or do you think both can coexist? Yeah, no, there is definitely, sorry, there is definitely, so there is definitely a balance uh, to me. Um, I was thinking about it. I think it's between speed and, of course, building a foundation of trust. Because you have to move quickly. There's so much ambiguity. There's so much uncertainty. You don't know if this decision is actually going to matter even in the long run. Maybe you just want to test something out quickly. So you have to move fast. And at the same time, you need to ensure that the way decisions are made builds that foundation of trust. So these two all the time cannot go together. So I think I'll build on what finally Kanika was saying. It's, it ultimately boils down to the intent. If the intent is of transparency and to build trust, then fundamentally you can manage it. And I, I can also, maybe I can compare from my prior corporate experience. So when I was in Swarovski and I was on several boards, Swarovski India, Swarovski Southeast Asia and so on. So there clearly, I mean the role of governance and board meetings was more to ensure that everything is going on correctly. So that was making sure that we as business leaders were not familiar with compliance and uh, other topics. So therefore, that, that's just a check to make sure that happens. In a startup, it's completely different because you're building a culture also from ground up and then they're of course dealing with the investors at the other end. So you have to, you have to balance both of these quickly. I don't know if you'll get it 100 out of 100 all the time, but I think if you get 8 out of 10, it's probably good. And, uh, uh, but the intent of transparency and trust, if it's there, I think you can go through the early stages. Vivek, I'm just going to stay with you and you talked about a score of let's say 8 to 10. Do you think the score varies from sort of the stage of the startup? Do you think a very early stage startup can have a lower score and it's okay to neglect governance or do you think, you know, 8 out of 10 should be the de minimis right through the journey? I think it all boils down to trust. When you're in an early stage startup, the only, uh, the only mechanism of trust with the other stakeholders is actually what the founder is saying and therefore does the behavior match with that. As the organization becomes more mature, you know, the brand becomes a bit well known, starts becoming an asset of trust in itself. Then there's the organization, there's the people, there are partners. So it obviously progressively becomes easier, I think. Of course, the number of moving parts will keep, uh, then the complexity increases, but for which you have to have supporting people and systems. So uh, I think in the beginning, it's it's... In a way, it's simpler because the first set of people, if you're talking about investors who put money, it's really on the founder's reputation. And the initial focus of the business and all professional investors know this, that um, they just want to make sure that everything is going on fine. And they're not hundreds of things that you have to waste your time on compliance on. And I think good investors know that. They know when to actually apply what kind of magnifying lens. Neo, if I can just take the same question to you. You know, you all have uh, been a great example of a, a really early stage startup and now transition to a listed company. And of course, your business is also about tracking what startups are doing. So do you see the sort of, again, to take Vivek's example of the governance score varying widely between early stage and later stage startups? So I think just the, so as you, uh, in the life cycle of the company, you know, as you grow from smaller to bigger, I think just the things that you touch increases, the touch points that you have increases, you know, to give you a small example, just the geographies in which you are present, uh, you know, may keep increasing and hence the kind of uh, compliances or the kind of things that is applicable to you, you know, that increases, your team size increases. Um, so 
so obviously you it's a gradual journey uh, you know you you would not want to overload the team with unnecessary things initially and as it becomes sort of critical you keep you know solving one problem at a time uh, so so i think yeah, yes it's definitely a gradual journey you have to be uh, whatever is applicable to you still have to be you know you still have to score like a high maybe uh, you know not like maybe not like 10 out of 10 but like a good enough score uh but i think just the things that you uh, touch upon as you grow in size that just increases and hence uh, you know you have to be more aware of out what all the other things that you have to be careful about as you are sort of growing uh, the organization the second thing also happens is that you know as you're growing the organization initially uh, you as a leader are in touch with most of the people and you know as the organization becomes large then you know there are lot of people you know who are the second or the third uh, you know level reporting so how do you basically in uh make sure that that same culture is actually translated across the organization that's probably the other thing that is very important as you grow in size that you know everyone is sort of taking a lot of decisions and so what are the basic core principles that they have to keep in mind so that you know everyone arrives with an answer which is not on the you know the wrong side uh, any time <laughs> Anika, maybe if I can get your perspective also on this, because again, as India questioned, you've invested very early stage and then seen many of your startups really traverse the journey and get uh, successful. How have you seen the scale of governance change? I, I think that the bar is always absolute, right? It's the parameters that go behind calculating it that keep changing. So like Neha was saying, you know, early on, maybe you're three people, so you know, how much misgovernance are you guys really going to get up to together right but as soon as there are 300 um the the touch points of risk uh, magnify so so of course that changes but but you know madhukar likes to tell this anecdote um where essentially somebody asked him that you know you give these 22 23 year olds four five crores 500k aren't you worried that he's just going to go and buy a car right um and madhukar was his point was that if he does go and buy a car, the failing is on my part, right? Because I gave this guy money and it's my job to trust whether you can give him money or not. And to me, in any case, that was a write-off then whether or not, because now you know what intent is. So 500k was a write-off whether or not the car was bought. So I think it is, um, your parameters change, um, but uh, the, the bar of are you at 8 on 10 or 10 on 10 should stay the same. So and again, just staying uh, with you, Kanika, one of the comments we often hear uh, in the conversation around governance is that the failures arise because of misalignment of interest between investors and founders. Just wanted sort of your perspective on that. Yeah, and I think that, uh, you know, a lot of this misalignment, again, is kind of cyclical. Lots of liquidity leads to a lot of bad behavior on both sides. And um, uh, essentially, I think everybody needs to sort of agree to this charter of good behavior, if you will, and, and sort of follow it where from a founder's perspective, you know, they're not taking secondaries too early or they're not, um, you know, asking for extra ESOPs at uh, certain times. How many angel investments are they doing? Uh, what are the related party transactions they're putting in place? So all of this seems like hygiene that should be in place pretty early. And same thing applies to investors, right? Uh, in terms of are you doing competing investments? Are you looking at competing investments? Why are you guys are evaluating this? If I'm a VP and um, an up round in this company suddenly going to give me a promotion, uh, I should probably disclose that to the board because my interests are no longer aligned with the company, uh, right? Uh, am I, uh, as a fund, trying to, uh, you know, get these guys to, uh, you know, be super angels in my other investments? Am I getting them to use my consultants and lawyers? So all of those are things that matter. Uh, and so governance, it's, it's a, you know, both sides need to agree that good faith, um, uh, you know, uh, the interests of the company should come first and then it's the interests of the individual, the fund and the founder. Um, and, you know, that should be the list of priorities. Sure. I'm just going to change tracks on the role of the board. I think uh, we've seen a lot of negative press on examples of startups that have failed in governance. And the question that's come up is, what was the board doing, right? How come, whether it was the founders, whether it was independent directors, and we'll come to that later, or whether it was investor nominees, how come they were all unaware of what was going on and... How is it that just one fine day the floor falls away? Neha, again, you've seen both internally and externally this happen. Uh, just your perspective on what should be the role of the board, uh, both formally and informally. Uh, right. So I'm actually of the view that, uh, you know, your uh, compliance and governance, that is a mandate of the company. 
primarily. So the company is the maker here and the company has to do you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. The board is more of a checker. So the board will, you know, may not have so much of detail about, you know, what is going on. That basically the executives of the companies, that's their responsibility to, you know, do that. Obviously the board has to be a good checker. Uh, so, you know, obviously, uh, like typically in investor board, it's more business oriented uh, work that is there and compliance is a smaller part. But obviously as the company matures, your compliance discussion in the board meetings, you know, that time slot sort of increases over time. So that is a natural progression that happens. And, uh, you know, yeah, I think in the light of so many cases which have come about, I think that is the other uh, new focus right now, you know, for investors that, you know, that is also a key part of, you know, your board management right now. Earlier mm -hmm. it used to be a lot more, I would say, focused on business. But I think, uh, you know, right now uh, the compliance is also coming to be, you know, in the forefront that that has to be there. Uh, but I, I, I still feel that board is more of a checker and it is still the responsibility of the company and the executives to actually ensure that everything is, is there. Anika, your perspective sort of sitting on the other side in terms of the role of the board and when should the board uh, raise flags and when should it sort of be supporting the founders? Yeah, so, you know, um, I, I think I uh, agree, completely agree with what Neha is saying. So, uh, at IQ, when we invest in companies for the first two years, we don't even do any board meetings, right? Um, so, there's no like board where you have to like report these numbers and show this MIS, etc. They're so early, they're building so much, there's, there's no time for any of that. So I think that, um, you, know, you know, all of that comes in much, much later in the journey. But having said that, that doesn't mean that you're not building good practices on day one. Um, just simple stuff like how do you design your MIS, right? What do you consider revenue? What are the intellectually honest metrics that you want to track, that you want your investors to track? Um, all of those are things that uh, we spend a lot of time on with the companies. But, um, you know, the whole formal structure of having a board in place and, and uh, having governance, I think around uh, Series A or slightly before that is when it comes into play. And um, while, while she's right that it is the responsibility of the company, I don't think it's completely fair to say that the board can just sort of be like, uh, <laughs> you know, we didn't know. Of course, uh, it's your job to know. So if you've not put the right metrics and the right checks and balances in place, uh, it's, it's as much your fault as it is the company's. And uh, Kanika, are you a proponent? And, and sorry, sorry, not just that. You're, you're also, uh, it's not your money, right? You raise this money from LPs. They are investing through you in this company. So you already have a fiduciary responsibility to somebody else that you can't be asleep on the wheel uh, on the board either. So sorry, I didn't mean to cut you, but that's important. No, that's a great point. And just sort of staying with our conversation on boards, uh, you know, for listed companies, it's mandatory to have independent directors. Do you believe that at some stage, whether it's revenue-based or valuation-based, startups should also be asked to have independent directors. Do you think that brings better governance? Um, uh, frankly, jury's out um, on, on how good these independent directors are, even on public boards, right? Um, some of them have been there on, for 20 years. How independent are you really at that point? Um, I think that the, the way to really look at it is, as, as soon as you're adding somebody on your board, what is the... Um, value they can bring to the company in terms of, you know, either somebody who's uh, very experienced in setting up systems. So, for example, when uh, we were taking matrimony public, right, the independent directors you were adding were people who could do a better job with systems and processes, somebody who could do a much better job with, uh, you know, marketing or, or looking how to build your uh, story better externally. And all of them are in independent folks, but it can't just be um, you know, you're just sort of signing off and saying, here's an independent guy and my job is done. It, it, there has to be legitimate value addition um, that, that they're bringing to the table also. You know, there's an anecdote about uh, a very senior lawyer who at one point used to serve on some 40 boards as an independent director. And of those 45 were cement companies. Right. So he's definitely independent because he has no idea what's happening on any of them, right? So. Right. And then when asked, you know, how do you sort of not share secrets from one cement company or other, he said, no, I have very strong compartments in my mind. So I guess there are good examples to uh, take away. Uh, Vivek, I just want to come back on the point of MIS, you know, because I think one of the themes we're hearing is that the board also relies on the quality of data that the sort of management puts up. And at least sort of my view a little bit is that Startups are often carried away by a lot of vanity metrics, you know, fancy jargon and all of that. Is it time for management and boards to just review some very basic P&L cash flows, you know, the old-fashioned textbook metrics rather than some of the new jargon? Uh, 
Um, no, so your question is, uh, how do you figure well, out what's the right? You, uh, yeah, what's the right metrics that uh, you know should be exchanged between boards and management? Is it time to go back to basics and sort of avoid the jargon because that's where a lot of the details get missed out? So I mean, I'm I'm a very uh, new founder. I mean, just uh, barely two years, and uh, uh, we are fortunate to have uh, great investors. Shanti and Let's Venture is one of them. Uh, but I actually connect with what Kanika was saying. We're in that phase of those first two years where we, you know, I have regular updates with the investors and yeah, of course, there is that MIS and that sheet, but actually what's more enriching is the entire discussion around it, you know. So what are the challenges you're facing? It's not just about revenue, but we, I mean, we, we report everything, you know, which goes down to the burn and all of that. So that's, uh, and I think that's how it is. If you have the right intent and trust, then you just build it like that. And as we go along, I th I'm sure that we will progress and grow accordingly. I, I, I think it's all horses for courses, stage by stage. That's how it will be. Just very quickly, uh, Neha and then you, Kanika, do you want to sort of give an example with or without names on instances you've seen where somebody really was falling off the cliff on governance but was sort of able to, you know, resurrect and put things back in order? Some, some great example of uh, governance gone wrong but people coming back or… So I think the other way is, is more difficult that, you know, things are already in bad shape and then, you know, I think that is a, a, a bad place to be in. I think you have to get that right from beginning. Uh, I've seen good examples actually. So I've seen examples wherein, you know, uh, companies that started doing, focusing on that, you know, like 10 years front and then it paid off, you know, after a few years. So I've seen more examples of those that, you know, uh, th these are some of the things that get noticed only when, uh, you know, shit hits the fan. So, and there are a lot of good work that may go unappreciated for a lot of years, you know, uh, you know, and that becomes like an hygiene. So, I, so I think I've seen a lot more companies on the other side that, you know, who have actually uh, sort of been mindful from that from the beginning and that has paid out after a few years. Kanika, any turnaround examples you have? No, actually, I, I, I want to just uh, commend all the new startups that have gone to the public markets instead, right? Uh, I think there's far too much coverage we give to everybody who's doing a terrible job with governance, but, you know, Zomato, uh, Paytm, uh, Traction, all of these guys, you know, uh, consistent metrics, reported on time, um, you know, telling uh, the investors exactly what they're doing. And public markets is, no, like, they're not valuing you based on any sort of vanity metrics, their P&L balance sheet cash flow. So they really care. And it takes six weeks to win, six quarters to win uh, public markets trust and you can already see you know lots of uh, prices improving etc because they've managed to build that kind of good behavior uh, in public for for six quarters or so um so so i think i would probably want to leave with that okay, no great example so i think we are sort of uh, getting to the end one practical tip from each of you to startups here on what should they do uh, differently or what should they continue to do or what should they stop doing so one practical tip just starting from uh, practical tip, uh, GMV is not revenue, uh, so uh, let, let's be, like, like we, we've been talking about metrics, I think um, at Sugar, for example, you know, we've been in there right from the beginning, no idea what gross revenue is, right? It's tell me your revenue after GST, after etc, because that's the only number that matters, what is the money that hits your bank? Um, so build intellectually honest metrics that actually will tell you something about the business and, um, you know, the state of it uh, would be my most practical um, from my side, it would be, I mean, obviously intent and trust are the fundamental first blocks, but my, it would be, I think, educate yourself. You know, a lot of times we get into this and sometimes you need to educate yourself on the lot of complexities and nuances, you know, in SHAs and SSAs and, and then when cap table structures change, even at early stages and sometimes without knowing, you might actually avoid uh, sharing some bit of information. So you want to, you know, avoid that. So educate yourself and I don't think we really think about that and do that enough. I think one practical th uh, tip that I have is essentially whenever you, you have to take a lot of decisions and uh, you know one way to think about a good framework is that whatever decision that you're taking think that it will be on the front page of the newspaper the next day and if you're fine with that then that means probably it's a good decision or you have you know it's okay to do that so that's a you know good thing to sort of think whenever you're thinking about you know complicated decisions. No, that's a great example. What we tell our clients when they ask us is that if a tax guy came and woke you up in the middle of the night and asked you something, what would the answer be? That's exactly how you should think of governance. So, 
I think we're running out of time. Uh, maybe just one or two quick questions from the audience, if any. Otherwise, we'll wind up the panel. Uh, yeah. So, what do you what do you do about gray areas, which are you know, most startups will be in some sort of a gray area. You know, uh, financial systems uh, there are changing all the time. The regulation in finance changing, blockchain, crypto, all of that has happened. Gaming is going through it. So, you know, that's not so much about governance or hardcore compliance. Uh, the game changes or the goalpost changes. How do you handle uh, investments and companies in that gray area? How, any, any tips on that? You want to take that, please? Well, I think... Uh yeah, two things. So one is basically, obviously, you you know, you talk to peers. What has been the tr practice? So that uh, works for a lot of uh, industries which have been there for long. Uh, you know, maybe not crypto, but maybe for some of the traditional things. You just basically see what is what people have been doing and companies that you respect. Uh, that is one thing. The second thing is that you try to understand what is the spirit of the law. So you know, sometimes uh, you know, uh, like a lot of people will actually tell you to take like very aggressive stance. Uh, but then, you know, you have to also a little bit de deep dive into what is the spirit of the law and how will that unfold. Um, and a lot of times, you know, it does not uh, impact you. Like, you know, the good example is, uh, you know, a decade back when a lot of companies were starting, there was this uh, B2B, B2C e-commerce structuring which was there, which was not so much, you know, in the spirit of law, but like that, you know, um, nothing will happen to the companies because, you know, those are great products and those continue to be. But there might be some of the companies who should be caught on the wrong side and then, you know, if you're one of them, then that will be a very painful journey. So, uh, you know, I guess the second thing is also just probably understanding the spirit of the law at some times. Oh, great. Thank you.